Let's take our Bibles tonight, please, and we'll turn over to First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 29. Thank you, Bradley. I appreciate you playing. First Chronicles chapter number 29. And uh, there's a couple of times a year, two or three, I would guess, I think I'm right, uh, where I focus in on this topic. And it's an important topic. In fact, maybe to a fault, I, I don't cover this topic a whole lot. And uh, the reason I don't is that this topic is much misused and abused, uh, especially by TV preachers. Uh, and that is the topic of, uh, of material goods, of finances. And uh, there is, though, an importance to finances. What you do with finances shows what you as a person, what a church will do, uh, what a nation will do with more important matters. Uh, Jesus said it this way. He said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And when He was talking about that which was least, He was talking about finances. He was talking about money. Uh, someone who will do a little job well will do a big job well. Someone who is trustworthy with a small amount will be trustworthy with a large amount. So, um, vice versa. Someone who uh, will not do a small job well will not do a large job well. And someone who is not faithful with a small amount of money or small amount that's trusted them will not be faithful with a greater amount. It's a biblical principle. And so uh, money has a great deal to do uh, with our hearts because Jesus said this. There's just no... No bones about it. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there, there's an inseparable link between your treasure and your heart. Of course, we know uh, treasure isn't just monetary things, though it is, does include that. It does include the things and the money that God has entrusted to us. But some of the other treasures we have that God has given us, He's given us talents. I know there's some people that in this room said, I don't have any talents. No, everybody in this room has talents. You have God-given gifts that you bring. And, and by the way, many times you don't even realize how important your talents are in God's work. But God puts us together as a body to all accomplish God's work. Uh, David Leonard's in heaven tonight. And that's not the doing of one person or two people. That's the doing of God's church working to reach out to the lost. And so God's given you the treasure, yes, finances, but He's also given you talents. He's given you unique abilities, unique knowledge, unique experiences that you should use uh, for the glory of God. And then God has given us time. And we looked at that this morning in Ecclesiastes. He's given us time. We're all millionaires. Uh, if you live to be 80 years old, you've you got 42 million minutes. And uh, if you live to be 40 years old, you've got... Half of that, 21 million minutes. So we're all millionaires. We don't realize it. We don't realize what valuable stuff we have, this stuff called time. And we need to use that time wisely. We don't want to be like those, uh, those people who just uh, spend all their money and spend all their time. We want to be wise. We want to invest our time. Uh, we, do we have to go to work? Yeah, we have to go to work. We have to labor. But why not invest our time while we're at work? Uh, we, we, we have chores to do around the house. Yes. But why not invest that time uh, while we're doing it? Why, why not look for those everyday moments when we can influence our children, our grandchildren, and those around us? So God's given every one of us treasure. And uh, with that treasure, we need to make sure we are honoring the Lord. Uh, if you are faithful in least, you'll be faithful in much. Here in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, we see a group of people that offered offering unto the Lord. And we're not going to pass the plate again at the end, don't worry. I'm not trying to raise a little more money tonight, um, but we are talking about the budget tonight. This is the, the business side of the church that is an important part of the church. We need to be faithful in what God's given us. We need to be diligent with what God's given us. And uh, so uh, we need to talk about this manner of offering. And I want us to look, begin 1 Chronicles 29, uh, what David says. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Folks, any work done here at church is not for man. We're not trying to build our own little kingdom. We're not trying to build our own little empire. This isn't the empire of Tim DeVries or Vision Valley Baptist Church. It's not. This belongs to Jesus Christ. 
Uh, let's remember Revelation when the Lord said to those churches, He talked to those uh, the, the candlesticks and the stars. He talked about them being in His hand. We belong to God. This church belongs to God. I'm glad we take ownership and we say my church and we take ownership and responsibility. That's a good thing. But we must remember that this is not for man. This is for the Lord God. Verse 2, he says, Now I have prepared, David said, with all my might for the house of my God. God told David, David, you can't build this temple to me. You're a bloody man. David was a man of war. And he served the Lord as such. But David, God told David, you won't build the house, but your son will. Verse 2, Now I have prepared, David said, with all my might. He said, I may not be able to build it, but I can help Solomon build it. I can prepare and set aside things so that he can build it for the Lord. I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God the gold for things to be made of gold and the silver for things of silver and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron and wood for things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones and of divers colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Look at verse 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. What did we just say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What did David say? He said, I've set my affection to the house of my God. What does that mean? Does that mean he went up and gave the building a hug? No, that, that's not what he means. He means I am invested heavily in this place. He said, I'm invested. I, I've put my money where my mouth is, so to speak. And my heart is here to build the house of God. He said, I've set my affection. Colossians 3, 2. What does it say? Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And David said, I have set my affection to the house of my God. I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses withal, the gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. Help us to understand that there is a definite link between our treasure and our hearts. Help us to understand, Lord, that if we want our hearts to be in the right place, we must learn to put our treasure there by faith. Lord, help us to be obedient to you in this matter of treasure and of offering. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to see, number one tonight, that God's people, and David himself included, they offered stuff to the Lord. They offered stuff. They offered treasure. Look back again, uh, verse uh, verse 2, he said, I've prepared gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and onyx stones and glistering stones of divers colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Verse 3, he said, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Verse 4, even 3,000 talents of gold, 7,000 talents of refined silver. They gave stuff. They gave money. They gave things. Uh, the house of God is one place that some people think should operate with zero money. They think it should just operate because it's a religious organization. It's a spiritual organization. So they don't need any money to pay the light bill. They don't need any money to put diesel in the bus, folks. God's work cannot be done. It cannot be done effectively on pocket change. It can't. It can't be done effectively on leftovers. It cannot be done effectively... If God's work is going to be done properly, we must put God first in our finances. We must put Him first. Give Him the first fruits. You say, Pastor, you're preaching this because you're a pastor. No, I believe this when I, before I was a pastor. I believe this when I was a little child. That we need to give God of the first fruits. By the way, if we get defensive when we read what the Bible says about that, it's because our God is being talked about. Well, who is our God? If we're not careful, it can be materialism. It can be money. It can be stuff. And what does God want? God wants us to trust Him by faith and to give Him the first fruits. They offered stuff to the Lord. They offered money. They offered of what God had already entrusted to their hand. Uh, some people say, well, if, if God just gave me millions, then I'd be faithful. No, He wouldn't. Right, right. He wouldn't. Uh, if, if, God, if God can't uh, entrust $10 or $100 to you and you'd be faithful with that, there's no way He could entrust millions to you. Right. It may be. Now, listen, one of the gifts of the church is the gift of giving. 
Some people, that is a gift God's given them. How many would say, God, I want to line up for that gift? Yeah, I, I want to line up to have the gift of giving. Uh, what, what does it mean to have the gift of giving? It means that you are a channel through which God's blessing monetarily and financially can flow. Now, there are some people that have that gift. God has just miraculously blessed their finances. But do you know most of the work of God happens because faithful people are just faithful with whatever they have? Uh, you know, the buses that are on, uh, there aren't any millionaires. Now, if, if you are, let me know. I want to know. But we're, we're not running buses because there's, there's uh, Mr. or Mrs. Deep Pockets who just keeps everything going. Folks, it's because a lot of people are just faithful with what God's given them. Uh, we have to learn to be faithful, uh, to, that God can entrust us with more. I want you to see what David said. Look back at 2 Samuel. We'll come back to 1 Chronicles. Look at 2 Samuel, please. Chapter number 24. And again, I want to say this about giving and about offering. This is a personal matter, just like anything else. It is between you and God. Uh, you will never have anybody from church call you and say, well, what about this pledge you made? Or, or send you a letter, uh, like I've heard the Catholic Church does, and, and, and say, hey, you're, you're behind in your contributions. Folks, this is between you and the Lord. Uh, so uh, I want to encourage you to understand that this is for your blessing. This is for your benefit. I, I would not lie to you and tell you you'll never have any troubles if you give to God. That's just not true. You will have struggles. Sometimes your faith will be tested. It will be tested. Uh, I, I, any, anyone who gives can tell you their own story of how they were faithful to the Lord and their faith was tested, but God came through. You know, the Bible says, Is not the life more than meat? And the body than rain. The very fact that we're here tonight says that God has taken care of us. But I want you to see 2 Samuel 24. Uh, David had sinned against the Lord. He had numbered the people of Israel, which God had commanded that that should not be done. And uh, God gave David three choices. He uh, said you can, uh, you can run from your enemies. He said you can uh, die of famine. And, and uh, David chose the, the uh, judgment uh, look at verse, down in verse number uh, 15. God, uh, David chose the judgment of falling into the Lord's hand. Look at verse 14. David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for His mercies are great. His three choices were back in uh, verse 13. Seven years of famine, or three months running from their enemies, or three days pestilence. And David just said, Lord, I'm in your hands. Your mercies are great. Verse 15. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. There died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, from the north to the south, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil. God changed his mind about what he was going to do to Jerusalem and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arana the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aaron of the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aaron looked and saw the king. And his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things did Arana as a king give unto the king. And Arana said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept thee. And the king said unto Arana, Don't miss this, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. He said, You're not going to give this to me for free. Right. I'm going to buy this at a price. Why? Verse 24. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Can I ask you, what does the service of God cost you? What does it cost you? You see, our salvation costs Jesus everything. And our service for the Lord ought to cost us something. 
Uh, we, we shouldn't just be this new modern form of Christianity that's just looking for convenience Christianity. Well, if it doesn't interrupt my schedule, if it doesn't interrupt my plans, if it doesn't take away from the next toy I want to buy, uh, if, if it's not too much trouble, I'll serve God. Folks, God's work can't be done that way. God's work has to be done with people who are willing to sacrifice. I'm not saying, uh, I'm not saying don't provide for your family. I'm not saying don't use common sense. But I am saying... Is there anything that could inconvenience you for the cause of Jesus Christ? David said, I'm not going to offer that to the Lord which doth cost me nothing. Uh, we were having a big day one time and I overheard a, a, a fellow talking. He, was, he got on the phone. He was all excited. And uh, I was glad he was there. But he got on the phone. He was calling somebody. And he said, yeah. He said, you need to come down to this church, Vision Valley Baptist Church. And it was a big day. It was a day where we had food and other kinds of fun things. And he goes, yeah, they've got the food. They've got this. They've got that. And I, I overheard him. I was standing nearby. He's on the phone. He goes, and it doesn't cost a thing. <laughs> and I wanted to interrupt his phone call. <laughs> I wanted to say, wait a minute. Yeah, it does cost something. It costs a lot. It costs a lot. You, you know how we were able to do those kind of things, though? Not because there was a bunch of rich folks, but because some faithful people were just faithful with what they had. It was, for some, it was the widow's two mites. And what did the Lord say? He said, that lady put in more than they all. Why? She, she sacrificed. Uh, I want to ask you, what does your service to the Lord cost you? What does it cost you? Does it cost you friends? Does it cost you convenience? Does it cost you time? It's okay for it to cost us something. I want to remind you about uh, the Good Samaritan when he found uh, the, the Jewish man beaten up on the road. And what did he do? He put him on his own donkey. He brought him to the inn. Who paid for the inn? The Good Samaritan. He poured in oil and wine. Well, who bought that? The Good Samaritan. He left money with the innkeeper. He said, hey, if it costs you anything else, let me know and I'll pay you. It cost him something. You know, the most effective folks in reaching others, they give beyond themselves. They do. I'm blessed to hear of uh, people who go by in odd hours and bring meals to people and drive people here and drive people there and, and uh, buy shoes for people. I'm blessed. Yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for people being faithful in their offerings, but I'm blessed to hear people going out of their way to make a difference in someone else's life. That's a cost, but it's a worthy cost. It's an investment in other people. Back in 1 Chronicles 29, they first offered stuff to the Lord. I want you to see secondly what they offered to the Lord. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 5. David said, the gold, for things of gold, 1 Chronicles 29, 5. And the silver, for things of silver, and for all manner of work, to be made by the hands of artificers. There's work, there's hands involved. Verse 5, And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? What did they offer next? They offered service. They offered that which is a, one of the most valuable treasures you have, time. Service to the house of God. Uh, again, I, I, I can't start to name all the jobs different people do just to do what the church does. But folks, it requires many hands. It requires many hearts. It requires uh, many minds. It requires uh, many people willing to consecrate their service to God. Willing to serve. Um, do, you, do you want to just come to church and be fed? I hope you get fed. I hope you're blessed. But can I tell you how you'll grow by leaps and bounds? I mean, you'll grow by leaps and bounds. First of all, I just want to get you faithful in church. You come, you get faithful in church, you're going to hear the Word of God, you will grow. But you, you reach a certain level by doing just that. You know how you'll grow by leaps and bounds? When you start to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When on Sunday you come in and your thought isn't, who's going to be a blessing to me? But your thought is, who am I going to be a blessing to today? When your thought isn't, what can the preacher give me today? But your thought is, I wonder if I can win a soul today. When you come in prepared to teach, prepared to serve, prepared to usher, prepared to greet some visitor, when you come in not just looking for your friends, the ones you always talk to and, and the people that you know already love you, but you come in, you go up to that guest, that visitor, and you make them feel at home. That's service. That's service. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to say this. I say this about once a year, and I'm thankful we've never had an issue with it, but I'm going to say it just so we don't ever have an issue with it. Uh, you, you've seen these vulture Christians, right? When a visitor comes in, the, the Christian, the brand new visitor is sitting in their seat. <laughs> yeah, your name's on the seat. I know. You wrote it under the bottom of it or something. Your name's on the seat somewhere. And that visitor, they just don't know, do they? You paid for that seat. I mean, that's your seat. Everybody knows. Don't go in that pew. That's their seat. And so, what does a vulture Christian do? They're not going to just come out and say, hey, buddy, move. You're in my seat. But they, they swoop by like the vulture. <laughs> You know, give them the evil eyes. They swoop behind that pew. Yeah, we're glad you're here. I, I thank God I haven't seen that much. And if you have been doing it, you should feel a little guilty right now. But listen, service. I, I mean, when you come in Sunday, don't. I, I'm glad. See your family. See your friends. But how about go out of the way and see that person that doesn't know where they're going? I mean, this is their first time here. That's service. That's service. Uh, when, you, when you come on Kids Crusade and, and you're hot and you're sweaty and we're singing Father Abraham, we're jumping up and down out of the pews and, and we'd rather just be sitting in the easy chair and watching the game. And, and you know, when you're uh, dealing with three or four kids, showing them from the Bible how to be saved, that's service. You know, when you're driving that bus, when you'd rather be home and it's sweaty and it's hot, that's service. And that will help you to grow more than many other things. What did they offer to God? They offered stuff, but they offered service. Look at Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. In Malachi, God had some harsh things to say to these folks. I said this earlier. I preached a few months ago about paying a preacher. And I said this, and it's absolutely true. A church should want to pay their pastor, but a pastor should be willing to serve the Lord whether he gets paid or not. Uh, if somebody is in this for a career, they shouldn't be in this. If this is just career advancement, if this is, oh, this is my job, I, you know, I, I, I wanted to go to do this and do this, but I decided I'm going to be a pastor instead. No. No, it's a calling. It, it's something that you serve. And here in Malachi chapter 1, I want you to see these people's attitude towards service to the Lord. Look at Malachi chapter 1, look at verse 6. The Bible says, A son honoreth his father and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? Ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. God, what you have to offer us, it's not very much. We don't, we don't like what you have to offer. We have better career options somewhere else. Verse 8. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Well, let's see. I've got to bring something down to the house of God. So we got that old blind goat out there. I mean, we can't do anything with him anyway. Nobody bought him at the flea market. Yeah, he's good enough for the house of God. We, we used to have a joke at, at some workplaces. This is good enough for government work. Yeah, that's good enough for government work. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, if we're not careful, we have the same mentality about God's work. Well, that's good enough for God's work. Just the church. You know, give God the leftovers. God didn't like that. Notice what He said. He said, verse 8, If ye offer the blind for the sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? He said, if, if you treated your governor the way you treat me, God said, would he be happy with you? If you gave him the same attention you give me, God said, if you gave him the same priority you give to me, would he be pleased? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts, verse 9. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? Now look at verse 10. Now let me say before I read verse 10, it's right to pay people for agreed upon services. It's right. A church should not expect that everything done at the church should be free. A, a church should not call up an air conditioning guy to give us cool air, praise God, tonight, and then just go, well, God will pay you back, brother. You know, uh, you know, thanks for the free on. We're not giving you a check. That's dishonest. That's not right. So we should, we should pay our bills. On the other hand, 
You shouldn't just come do service for the Lord because you're going to get paid. That's right. There ought to be service you're willing to do and you're not expecting one dime for it. And notice what the Lord said, verse 10. He said, who is there even among you? He couldn't find one with the right heart. He said, who is there among you that would shut the doors for naught? He said, I can't even find somebody to just to lock up the place unless they get paid. He said, neither do you kindle fire on my altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. These people were not offering their service to the Lord. Look at verse 11. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, in that ye say, the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness is it. Oh, and we gotta, we gotta... Go teach that class again. we got to run that bus. Again, I thank God. I don't sense that spirit in our church. I praise God. We need to guard against it. We need to be careful. Well, we have to go soul winning. No, we get to go soul winning. Yeah, yeah we got to have Kids Crusade. You know, I mean, every church has VBS. we got to do something. So we're going to have Kids Crusade. And yeah, better show up. I mean, that's other people are going to think things. <laughs> Folks, if that's your motivation... I'm not going to tell you don't come. I'm going to tell you get your heart right and then come. Is that your motivation? Well, I don't... Yeah, you know, we got to do it. That's what everybody's doing. No. No. Serve because you want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And if your heart's cold and backslidden, confess it to God and get it right. Notice, verse 13... Ye said also, Behold, what a weariness is it, and ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts, and ye have brought that which was torn, and the lame, and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? What were they giving God? All the leftovers. All the leftovers. But cursed, verse 14, be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. He said, Could you have done better? Could you have done better? You know, we sing that song, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? That's a challenging song to sing. Because when, when I sing that, I realize there are places I haven't done my best for Jesus. Lee Robertson, I was talking to him when he was older. I got the privilege to take him to the airport. I said, what's one of the greatest battles you have in the Christian life? He said, not giving Jesus my best or giving Him second best. You know, that's a battle we all have. If we're not careful, we forget the Lord. He just becomes, we put Him on the back burner. He becomes second thought and we give Him the leftovers of our lives. No, He deserves the very best. He deserves the first fruits. He deserves the first thought of our day. He does. Look at verse 14. Cursed be the deceiver which hath in his flock a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts. And my name is dreadful among the heathen. Back in 1 Chronicles 29, please, what did they offer? They offered stuff. <coughs> then they offered their service. David said, who's willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Verse 6, then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains, notice the leadership, they're the ones taking the lead in God's service. The captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold and notice of silver and of brass and a hundred thousand talents of iron. Verse 8, precious stones were found that gave them the treasure of the house of the Lord. Verse 9, then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. Can I ask you why you give? Again, this is between you and the Lord. Nobody's going to come and ask you why you give. But what does God want? The Lord loveth a what? A cheerful giver. Cheerful. Again, it's all in your mentality. If your mentality is selfish and it's all based on what you can get out of this life, then you might give grudgingly. You might say, well, yeah, I've got to go do this. I've got to give this. because It's expected. Folks, again, nobody's going to call you. Nobody's going to talk to you. It's between you and the Lord. Do you have a heart that says, I want to give? If we would just tap into this, we'd understand one of the greatest joys in life is to be a giver. 
It's to be a giver. Uh, how many of you know the joy of giving? You just you get excited. It's, it's a birthday party. You give somebody something. It's Christmas. You give them something. You, you hand something to somebody. Doesn't it thrill your heart? Isn't it a blessing to you? By the way, on the reverse of that, let me chase a little rabbit. It's a small one. Let me get it. Somebody wants to give you something. A child walks up. They want to hand you a chocolate chip cookie. They want to hand you a piece of candy. They want to give you a card. You know the worst thing you can do? Oh, no, thank you. I don't want that. I don't need that. You know the best thing you should do? Thank you very much. You know why? Because that person receives a blessing from giving. They receive a blessing. Uh, when, I, when I was a teenager growing up, that we, our youth pastor, he'd try to give us things. He'd go, no, we, no, 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 you know, we don't want to do that. He'd say, don't rob me of my blessing. Don't rob me of my blessing. Uh, that's a need. It's a need to give. We need to figure that out early in life. The most miserable people truly are those who are always looking for someone else to do for them. They're miserable. They're miserable because in their minds they think nobody's doing enough for them. It's just the way it is. But if you will change your perspective and you'll decide, hey, I'm going to look to see what I can do for others, it will transform your life. Notice what happened with these people, verse 9. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all. That's an important word. All. That is in the heaven and in the earth. Well, does everything in our houses include all that's in the earth? Yes. Uh, everything in our garages, everything in our bank, everything in our closet. Does that include all? It does. Let's not forget this. All that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and Thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of Thee. Anything we have comes from God. And Thou reignest over all, and in Thine hand is power and might. And in Thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank Thee and praise Thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? You know what David recognized? That God had done, done a spiritual work in his heart to give him that kind of willingness to offer to God. Notice, for all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners. We're just here for a little time. We're just passing through. As for all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. This isn't our permanent home. Again, how silly would it be to go visit a, a, a city and spend all your life savings on the hotel room? It'd be foolish. Because you're just staying there a little while. Yeah, you need to spend some there. You need to be comfortable while you're there. It's good to be comfortable and enjoy that time there if you can. But don't put all everything lock, stock, and barrel in that hotel room. Folks, we're just passing through this world. Amen. Don't put everything you have lock, stock, and barrel in this hotel room called this world. Right. Verse 16, O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thy holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. You know what they recognized? That whatever they had already came from God and they were just giving it back to God. Now I want you to see last of all, number three, what they gave to the Lord. They gave stuff. They gave their service. Number three, they gave themselves. They just gave them their entire lives to the Lord. They gave their hearts to the Lord. Look at verse 17. He said, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart. Can I say that giving financially does not remove your obligation to give God your heart. You can't write a check and get out of the command to love God with all your heart. You can't. I don't care how big the check is. Now you can try. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Truly, I'm kidding. Okay, I'm kidding. I don't care how big the check is you write. I don't. That doesn't get you out of what God wants the most from you. You think, do you honestly think 
that God's work won't survive if you don't give all your money. You think God is saying, listen, uh, we, I, I don't need your heart, but just give me all your money because I'm really needy. Is God really that needy? He's not. He does own the cattle on a thousand hills. And it's amazing how things come from the most unlikely of places in God's work. It's amazing. So I'm not saying it's not important for us to give our money. But if you give financially, that doesn't mean, okay, so now, Lord, I just live however I want to. I don't need to obey you because I'm giving a lot of money after all. Oh, no. You know what God wants above all? He wants your heart. He wants your love. He wants, he wants to be number one in your heart. You can't buy God off. You can't say, well, God, I gave you this money, so now I can just do whatever I want. That's not how it works. Verse 17, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here to offer willingly unto thee, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, please, and we're going to be done. What did they give? They, got, they gave God themselves. Can I ask you a question? Do you understand that our lives do not belong to us? We're bought with a price. We're bought with a price. So what are we to do because we're bought with a price? The Bible says, therefore, because you're bought with a price, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Here in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Folks, they, these, were, these were poor people. They were poor people. Their deep poverty. I, I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have to say it. When we were little, we'd say, we're so poor, we used to go to KFC and lick other people's fingers. That's how poor we were. <laughs> That's how poor we were. <laughs> we really did that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but these people are poor. They're poor. Say, Pastor, I, I can't give to the Lord because I don't have a bunch of money. Hold it. These people had deep poverty. Deep poverty. Not deep pockets, deep poverty. They opened their wallets and moths came out. That's what they had in their wallet. Deep poverty. Notice what he says though. In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. Isn't it an amazing thing? You look at pictures of children in third world, third world countries and just to see this big beaming smile. And then come to America where we have, we can go to the store and buy almost any food we want any time pretty much that we want. And people are miserable and medicated and all kinds of things. Why? Because we've missed out on something. Right. We've missed on this joy that there is with giving. We've missed, we, we've become really selfish. It's all about us. And because of that, we're miserable. Yeah, that's good. Notice, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded under the riches of their liberality. They gave even though they had very little to give. For to their power I may bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, don't miss this, but first, before they wrote the check, before they sent the goods, before they bought the pair of shoes, what did they first do? First, gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Are you doing the will of God for your life? Have you given yourself to the Lord? Let's bow our Hi everybody, today. this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure 
that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.